we are back here again on a Thursday for Thinking Like Pants Optional, and where we give you the choice of how you show up to this event. Um, and we have two absolutely amazing guests. Um, and if you signed in early, you got a little pre-taste, um, a couple of, <laughs> couple of live mic moments <laughs> um, that we will do our best to uh, recreate in some form. Um, we've got the Ski Brothers, not really, Brothers from Other Mothers, um, uh, Craig Dubinsky and Mike Endersky here. I'll let them introduce themselves after I give a little preamble on Capsule, because if you're new to this format and you're wondering what on earth are they doing and why is this around um, and what who would have invented such a thing, we started this uh, in the 2008 recession to help connect our friends because we're a curious crew and want to learn from others. So uh, we said about the, the process of finding people that would inspire us and give us interesting conversations. Um, and as a firm, uh, as we entered into this environment, we had to remove the, um, the pants option um, or their pants requirement, I should say, and make it a little bit more flexible for this. Um, but Capsule, as the primary sponsor to this um, and inventor of this thing, uh, is a special projects firm uh, in Minneapolis. I happen to be in South Bend, Indiana right now. And uh, my co-host, Kelly, and I um, host this conversation, talk about design, design thinking, marketing, um, promoting yourself, promoting your brand, entrepreneurship, all kinds of other interesting, fun things, all subjects we enjoy. And uh, you can see more of that at capsule.us of our firm, which we will put up in the chat at some point in time. Oh, there we go. From Capsule to everyone. Um, <clears throat> that is my, the extent of my preamble. Um, <laughs> we ask that everyone else remains on, on mute as we're on this. But we love video because we love to see video, we love to see faces, and we love to see people get up thinking their video's not on anymore and leave the scene and then come back or do other things. That's always fun. And, uh, and so I'm going to hand it over to Craig first and then Michael to give a little introduction on themselves, a little background. Um, and then we're going to pepper in some really interesting questions. But we're not going to need a lot for this one because it is going to be lively. I'm certain of that. So Craig, take it away. Give it was a wow. wow. Well, first of all, thank you for, for having me and, um, and for everyone for getting up early and joining. It's, it's, a, it's a treat. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And for those of you uh, who are on the East Coast and Northeast, I hope you all have power and then you're not watching this from uh, inside your, your car with your phone plugged in. Um, and I hope everybody's keeping safe and healthy. So I'm Craig. I'm a Capricorn. I'm coming to you live from the third floor of my house in lovely Montclair, New Jersey. And uh, if you don't know Montclair, it's a lovely town. It's 12 miles outside of New York City. It's fabulous. And I'm the friendly founder of Hello Products, and we make naturally friendly toothpaste. So I'm looking for sound. There you go. And, um, and I'm now also the chief innovation strategist at Colgate, which is a fabulous thing, which maybe we'll talk about a little bit later because I'm really, really excited about some of the stuff I've got. Uh, the chance to get involved with there. And I love brands and I love storytelling and I love people more than anything. And I think people write their own narratives through their stuff. So I'm kind of obsessed with trying to find ways to get people better stuff. And uh, design is a really important thing for, for me. So that's it. I'm going to pass it over to my friend, Mike Adursky. So I'm so excited to be here with Mike because I haven't I seen love, you in a while. I love this man. First of all, I, I just saw on our ticker, we just hit 3,500 people watching this. So Woo! that's amazing. just amazing. Aaron, you did an amazing job. Lee, I'm telling you, amazing job. Uh, I'm a Sagittarius, obviously the, the, the apex of the um, ast astrological signs. And uh, I've been in this crazy business for about 30 years. And after working for companies, amazing companies like Bliss and Burt's Bees and L'Oreal, I looked at the industry and I, I just couldn't believe that after 30 years, we're still selling people stuff with ingredients which shouldn't go on your skin, and packaging which isn't sustainable, making claims we can't keep for prices are too high on products we don't need. And I decided to just buck the system, try to write the system. I started this company called Hear Me Raw, and here it is. And it's raw, powerful, natural, sustainable. And we want to give a new definition to wellness, a new definition to clean, and just rock the industry. And I'm so excited to be with Aaron, who I've known for years and years, and Craig, who owes me sushi and a guitar. And I'm just ready to rock today. 
Awesome. There's there you go. In the there you go. Oh, that is so good. That's raw, raw good. for your skin, raw for your fish. It's Jeez. fabulous. <laughs> Uh, right. Uh, we'll have to explain the Jenna Jameson reference uh, later on in the conversation. Clearly, or it's not. good to dangle. Or not. Dangle or not. That. <laughs> Just dangle that out there or dangle that out there. Yeah. Because people and dangle are dangle is, is an important word at this hour. Oh, yes. wow. Yes. Yes. There's no limit to the references. Okay. That's Kelly, early. you want to take it's it early. away with our, with our uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, And I'll also say, I think we, for those of you that have attended Thinking Link before, our handy chat box to, uh, to the right or left, depending on your screen, um, please uh, add questions, comments. We love commentary. I know our speakers will as well. And we will try to get to those questions as we make our way through the conversation. So, so yes, again, thank you, uh, Craig and Mike, for joining. We'll jump back in uh, to some questions just to prompt some conversation, although I don't think we'll need to really have questions to, to have an interesting discussion today. Uh, but Mike, you were touching on this as were, was or Craig with regard to transparency, natural ingredients. Let's talk about in health, beauty, self-care. Um, obviously there's a lot of noise uh, today with what's included rather than, um, or what's not included in your products. Um, rather than talking about something more meaningful. So when we talk about your brands, Hello and um, Hear Me Raw, um, you're creating those products that have impact and you're doing this in a way that we're transparent about what is going in, into our bodies, onto our skin. Um, how are you seeing, both of you, I'd love your perspective, seeing brands large and small move towards more responsible practices um, with ingredients um, and how they're articulating that then to their audiences? Uh, who wants to start? Well, I'll start. Great. I, I think um, a lot of brands are diving in and trying to do the right things. But um, what I don't like is a lot of brands are hiding behind this word clean. And this mm -hmm. whole idea of clean beauty. And uh, I think clean has become a dirty word. I think it's been completely bastardized. I think that marketers are implying that clean means it's natural, it means sustainable. I just did a survey and I found that 90% of people think that when something is labeled clean, that it means that it is natural, that it means that it is sustainable, but it's not. You can be completely synthetic and completely non-sustainable and call yourself a clean product. And I think that's absolutely wrong because the, the, the crux of what clean needs to be is well-being. And if you believe, as I do, that a synthetic ingredient should not be put in or on your body um, and that you, we need to take care of our world, then it fails in both of those cases. So what I'm trying to do, I know a lot of my competitors are trying to do this also, is try to raise the definition of clean, make sure that it has to be natural, make sure it has to be sustainable. It can't just be, it doesn't have crap in it. I mean, that's just a lame excuse and a lame definition. So we need to raise the bar some retailers are doing a really great job. Sephora's raising the bar, Credo's raising the bar, but the manufacturers need to raise the bar. Stop hiding behind this faux definition of clean and really make clean stand for something. Like it. Awesome. All right. All right, so I'll, I, I'd i love to, to jump in on that too. And, and one of the things you mentioned was, um, you know, folks are, are I think interested more and more and more these days in transparency. They want to know where things have come from, what they do. Um, and I'm with you, like, like labels, like clean labels, like even sustainable. Like I hear these words all the time. I'm sure we all do. Right. Um, why well, just make something that's sustainable? What, what if we up the game? Like I want to make things that aren't just sustainable, but that are eternal. Like that's much more aspirational and much cooler than sustainable. Cause I could say that, you know what, that, uh, that, metal canister of something you got, you can tell me all day it's sustainable. You know, the truth of it is everything at some point, if you put it in the ground, will go away. It may take a million years, but it's going to go away. Is it really sustainable? And did that metal thing you, you got come in uh, three different layers of other packaging material? Like, tell me how you got it. How much fossil fuel was wasted bringing it to you? Tell me the carbon footprint of the effort that it took to make that thing and bringing it to you. So we see people that are like, oh, but our thing comes in glass. And I'm like, guess what? It takes 10 times the amount of energy to make that thing in glass as it mm -hmm. takes to make it in something else. And it's heavier and it can crack. And because it's heavier, it takes more fossil fuel to ship it to you. And where was it made? And no one's talking about that stuff. So there is a lot of noise out there. And the signal to noise ratio is getting a little bit off. 
So I'm, I'm with Mike and, you know, oral care, because hello, we, we make some other really cool things now too, because uh, we just launched a deodorant, which I'm excited about. But I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, um, this is our, our toothpaste package. And I want to show you this for a couple of reasons. So one is it's FSC certified paper. So we're not killing more trees and we print with soy based inks. Awesome. But the reason I really want to show this to you, I don't know if this is going to show up here very well. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Um, if not too clear, I could show you on the tube, but next to every ingredient, it might be better on the tube next to every ingredient. It tells you what it does. So you want to talk about transparency. Mm -hmm. It literally tells you the use behind every single ingredient that's in here. This is a fluoride free product on a fluoride product. You can't do that because fluoride is regulated. So you have to have a full monograph and there are just rules what you can and what you can't say, but we make fluoride and we make fluoride free products. And, you know, we have a lot of no's, right? No artificial sweeteners, no dyes, no artificial flavors, uh, you know, no SLS, lots of no's. But when you start upping the game and you start showing people where, and why mm -hmm. the ingredients that are in your product are there and you're explicit about it, it's really cool. And, um, and we think that that sort of takes this notion of uh, ingredient transparency and, uh, and efficacy to a new place. So I'll start the morning with my favorite thing to do. Don't ever do this. This is fluoride free. But... <laughs> I've seen him do well, this before. <laughs> uh, so, you know, pants optional, toothbrush that. optional. <laughs> yeah, toothbrush is optional. Mm, I spray around. Oh, it's so good. So, yeah. sorry, Barney, That's I heard impressive. that. What's the calorie count? Uh, actually, it's like point, it, it, it's a little less than one calorie per serving. So you're good. And no carbs, no carbs. So for it's the keto happening. people out there, the Atkins people, <laughs> keto, we, we, got you. we got you. Yeah, totally. You're, you're, you're good. Oh, that's terribly funny. Love it. No, thanks. But just oh, just jumping on, so jumping on what Craig said. Go ahead, Mike. Um, when we think about packaging in particular, you know, to me, it's about reusability. Uh, if you can reuse something, then you don't need to make it. You don't need to ship it. You don't need to try to dispose of it someplace. Mm -hmm. Right. So to me, the, the real innovations come from people who are doing real uh, reusability, refillability. You know, that's one thing we're doing. And again, I don't usually like show my stuff during these things. I want to talk about the issues at hand. But for us, we have this glass jar and we have a solid lid. And then when you finish using this, you keep mm -hmm. reusing the glass jar, you keep reusing the lid and you get refills and the refills are recyclable. And we calculate that we use about 90 percent less packaging than our competitors over the course of three years and the consumer saves money. So reusability to me is the key because all, because if you think about it, materials, like Greg says, there's only three types. There's things that are biodegradable, there's things that are recyclable and everything else destroys the planet. So this whole term about like uh, disposable cameras, disposable utensils, those just destroy yeah. the planet. There is nothing good from disposable anything. Mm -hmm. So we need to look at refillable, not disposable. Right. Or they're and, and uh, totally 100% yes, yes, yes. And it's a, a, a yes and a plus moment um, because sometimes people can't like go there mentally. It's, it's, it's tricky. Um, and what we've tried to do, like we have, a new, we have a new thing and I'm with you. I don't want this to be like a commercial for hello, but um, just because this is on the topic of, of sustainable and, uh, and hopefully eternal at some point, because, because Mike, I think what you're describing to me is is this notion of, of eternal. To me, that's a step up from sustainable. Yeah. Because because you have this beautiful vessel, it's beautiful. I mean, show that thing again. Show that thing again. It's really Aww. pretty. Aww. It's really pretty. So like, I would want to keep that, right? Like, you want to keep that. There's no reason to, mm -hmm. to toss that. See, it's kissable. It's huggable. It's beautiful. So you'd want to keep that, and then you keep refilling it. So we we think there are some options. We we have you know, some things in glass jars also. We have some things in metal tins um, that are pretty cool. These are toothpaste tablets. There's no plastic involved at all, but we have a new deodorant. And what's cool about this, apart from the fact that it works, which is kind of a miraculous and beautiful thing, and it'll smell fabulous, um, is that it's 100% post-consumer regrind. Like the, the actual material that this is all made from, including the elevator in here, the lift mechanism, the whole thing. Um, it's 100% it's post-consumer recycled material. 
and the whole thing is 100% recyclable. So you literally can toss this in anywhere and it'll go into any stream, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, so like, like you said, like they're just different ways of, of approaching it because we've seen some refillable deodorants. And unfortunately, like some of the, some of the UX is different. Like, like Mike, yours is you're putting your fingers in or some kind of applicator, right? Like you have a nice UX, like very nice UX. Some of the things we've seen, the UX has not been so great. So we, we are like balancing, but we never stop thinking about it. That's the thing. I mean, I, I can tell, you know, I, I know Mike, I know what passion is. Trust me. He's never stopped thinking about this. And we've never stopped thinking about this either. No. Um, it's fun. Like it's fun yeah. to try to figure it out. It is. The fascinating thing about this and, and the two of you talking about this, and I think we could have this entire conversation about this subject, which wouldn't be a bad thing at all. Um, it, we're continually advancing. If I look back on, I mean, to think about all the, the fact, the fact you're talking about a plastic that is 100% post-consumer waste is an impressive advancement for us as a society that we've done that. But we have to keep moving, right? We have to keep advancing and finding new ways to do this and materials being at the center of that. And yes, where they go, where they end up, how they are reused in a variety of forms make for interesting um, conversation for sure. I'm curious about, so you've described a little bit or touched on a little bit about the supply chain or when, where things come from and that transparency aspect. Um, I think it's Everlane. Kelly, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Everlane has done a great job of showing people. And I'm wondering if you're seeing something in the trends of coming out of this supply chain has been part of the conversation, right? Uh, it's been part of the pandemic conversation, right? Like, mm -hmm. how is the supply chain doing? What are we, you know, I think some things in sustainability have been tossed out the door in a hurry, um, which is sad because, you know, like how many masks, how many chemicals are we putting on our hands and our bodies and all the other stuff that's going on. But we're starting to get back to that. I'm curious what you're seeing when it comes to supply chain or conversations around supply chain and what that can contribute to on the transparency conversation, responsible conversation. That's not on our list of questions, so I'm surprising you, but I know I'll, I'll start with Craig because he's the improv. Yeah. Oh, no, I love it. Um, yeah, <laughs> life, life is kind of improv, so we'll, we'll yes and it up a storm. Um, yeah. So at first, uh, as an entrepreneurial <clears throat> person who's obsessed with design, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I looked at the supply chain because sometimes the supply chain kind of rules the roost and, and sometimes the, you know, folks that are the brand people are like, no, no, we want it this way. But the supply chain people tell you, no, um, I've told people in supply chain that we need to come up with a different name for what you do because chains are for prisoners and like, you shouldn't be a prisoner to the supply chain. Like we need to figure out how to work better together. So I'm still new in the world of, of Colgate, so I, I can't comment too much on that. But on the hello side, um, we all sit next to each other, or we, we did when our office was was open. Um, and we, we sort of worked, not sort of, we worked in concert to try to figure out, well, where can we source this? Is there a better way to get it? What do we do with the waste that we make as part of the supply chain? Um, so we try to think very holistically about it, because when we started hello, we had a clean slate. We had no there were no rules and regs. It was like, this is how you do it. The manual says you have to do it this way. We, we weren't encumbered by anything. Um, so we said, well, what, we're going to make waste because that's just part of the process when you make stuff. What can we do with it? And we partnered with this company and it, it costs us more money. It's something we talked about. That's the other thing. We didn't like put this on our website or anything. Um, but we worked with this company and they took our waste and they turned it into fertilizer for EPA approved use actually at a farm in Wisconsin. So our manufacturing waste was able to be used for fertilizer. And we wanted to try to think about the supply chain as part of the brand, like part of the offering, not just as this functionality that was going to get stuff from point A to point B. It was just going to get it made and then get it delivered. Um, so again, it's trying to think about it holistically and how you bake that into your thinking. And I think, like you said, given COVID and given uh, the situation where this is a global issue and products, goods and services have to move all over the place. We want to figure out like, how can we do it in the most efficient way possible? Um, and it's efficient on a lot of levels, not just economically efficient and not just from time management efficient. It's efficient in terms of uh, how you're taking care of the planet. Cause every time you move something, every time another person touches something, you are burning 
a lot of stuff, right? Not just not just fuels. You're burning out. Oh, Craig. Oh, no. Come back to us. No. Come back, Craig. <laughs> he's made this Come brilliant back. point. He's got this brilliant point, and he's oh. on the edge of his. Okay, we're going to hand it up to Mike. Okay. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take it from a little bit of a different stamp. I'll take it from a little bit of a different standpoint. If you've ever been into a big plant, whether it's a car plant or a detergent plant or a shampoo plant, it's about efficiency and about going smoothly. And what they don't typically want is change. When you make changes, it goes against efficiency and smoothness. Mm. So um, sometimes innovation fights with supply chain because they look for efficiencies. And the goal is to work with, there's the bell, I told you this would happen. Um, <laughs> I can't believe this. I can't freaking believe this. Um, you have to work with a supply chain that is flexible. Um, so and it's flexible, it could pick up a package at the door. Mike, right. you come. Craig, Craig, go. <laughs> All right, I'm going to stall for Mike. So Mike sometimes, <laughs> sometimes when Zoom doesn't cut you off and you talk too much, which was the case uh, when I was talking, um, you know, you got to be super, super flexible. And I think Mike was talking about, you know, how do you get people to change and, and get behaviors to change? And I think mm -hmm. John uh, sent in a question about that too. And it's really hard to do. It's really hard. Mike, did you get the pack? So you got dropped off. Unbelievable. Woo! I knew, I said there was a 15% chance that would happen. I was 100% right. There you go. There you go. Okay, so so take it back over. Go, go, go. No, I think my point was is, is because typical supply chains are built on efficiency and don't make any changes, it's to work with a supply chain where change is part of their ethos and philosophy or else you can't innovate. And, you know, and sometimes you just have to go around the conventional ways of doing it and create a new supply chain, which is kind of what we had to do on ours because quite honestly, our packaging wasn't being done before. Totally with, with you. We had to do the same thing with custom, especially with custom said, packaging. When you're cutting down your freight by 40%, you're cutting down your, your uh, warehouse space by 40% because you have smaller refills rather than large jars, then all of a sudden supply chain does become efficient. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting. Um, you reminded me of something, Mike. So when we first launched Hello, I, I worked with BMW, the car company BMW, and we designed this really amazing pack for our toothpaste. And it was like wildly more efficient than any toothpaste tube that had ever been made. We could fit double the amount of probably the biggest toothpaste tube you've ever seen in something that was half the size. And we figured out we could stack two more layers on a pallet and what would that mean? We had no secondary packaging. We had like all this amazing stuff going on. And also because of the material we were using, there was no preservative necessary inside the product. It had all these other benefits. And we put it on the shelf and frankly, people weren't ready for it. They're like, what the hell is that? And I'm used to buying something that's this big and your thing is this big. And even though it might have twice as much stuff in it, I don't even notice that because the shelf impression was you know, crap. I just didn't have a box and didn't look like a toothpaste tube. Actually, I have one over here. Um, people were like, what the hell is that thing? So it, it was a, it was a, a mess. Um, and I guess the point is it takes time to get people there. But we, quote unquote, innovators, all of us on the phone, because I think we're all, we're all in this together. We're all innovating. Um, we have to keep pushing it forward. We have to keep taking the ideas forward, the agenda forward. And you start, you're starting to see people adopt right? With refills, with concentrates, it is happening. Concentrates aren't new. They've been around for a really long time, but they're finally starting to, you know, gather enough momentum. Uh, and I think social media, as much as, you know, I have my, my issues with social media, as I'm sure we all do, um, it's a great tool to help spread the word about these things, right? Because when people can see pictures of other people using it or read comments, read reviews, from other people that are having really, really nice experiences with these types of products, then it, you start to see this, this revolution really you know, take hold. And, and to, to Craig's point, like if you look at uh, brands like Mirror, you know, the workout uh, device mm -hmm. where you have someone, mm -hmm. Peloton, that's a perfect example. You know, what, what might've started off as like a rich person's home luxury that they can show off to their friends who look at this Mirror thing I got to a necessity. You can't go to gyms and consumer right. behavior is going to change fundamentally because of coronavirus, because 
do I really want to go to a place where people are panting and sweating and lifting the same metal that I am? But if I can do it at home, so all of a sudden there's an insight and all of a sudden there's a virus and consumer behavior changes and that might become the new norm. I know a lot of yoga teachers who say, I'm shutting down my practice altogether and doing video only. Because do I really need to have a room full of people sweating in a, you know, together? And you don't. You can do yoga in your home just as easily as you can do it in a big studio. And I can do it easily. I don't have to go drive over there or walk over there. I need to shower up you know, at a strange place. So um, a lot of these innovations all of a sudden are taking hold as the world's been changing. And that might become the new norm for us. Well, I think once people realize that, hey, this is actually pretty cool, why would they go back? Like right now, this is a great example, right? We're all zooming it up. I know there's Zoom fatigue and it's a real thing and all that stuff. I don't want to discount that for, for some people. But frankly, I'm loving it because normally I, I'd be adding to my United 1K status. Like I really want more miles. It's like the last thing I want is more miles. It just doesn't, doesn't matter, right? To be able to get on board the plane you know, five minutes before somebody else, that's a big benefit. Who cares? I still have to get to the airport, you know, schlep all my stuff, deal with everything else. It's not about I'm inconvenience. It's that this is really effective. Not only is it convenient, but it's really effective. I'm sure if you're working out in front of your mirror or using your Peloton, you're having an effective experience. And that's the thing. So why would, why would we go back? It's not that I, I don't miss, you know, people in proximity, but I feel like we're having the shared experience and it's, I think it's pretty cool. So I think it's more intimate. And Aaron, yeah. by the way, the fact that you're reimbursing us for the plane fare, really appreciate yeah. it so Yeah, much. no problem. Yeah, awesome. come in the form of sushi and guitars with Jenna we'll Jameson it. on them. We'll take it, yeah. whatever, whatever we need to do. <clears throat> whatever compensation we can get to give you. Yeah, no, I, it is amazing. I, you've, I've met more people from all over the world. Um, I've been closer to more people in this form than ever before, but yet distance from my neighbor, right? Where I, right. I mean, I'm not wearing a mask here. I'm in a hotel in South Bend and no one will come near me because I don't wear a mask, right? Because I've got to be able to talk, um, but it's okay because I'm having a coffee. It's, it's safe, I can do that. Uh, so there shouldn't be any mask shaming, hopefully. Um, the, um, it is fascinating how how all these new behaviors are popping up and people are adapting to them. And, and if you can see it in a positive light and see the situation in a positive light, um, it's amazing what will come out of this in really good ways. Anyway, I'll hand it back to Kelly for her next question. Yeah, no, 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 and this, I'm gonna stay in the same vein because this, this is a great track in terms of, um, let's step out and look at macro trends, however. So we've talked about sustainability, obviously best practices um, and, and doing good. Uh, I'd love your, your thoughts or, uh, again, some perspective on, as we look at this line between human and technological devices start to blur, what are some of the pre and, I'm not even going to say post-pandemic, but we're, because we're in it now and for the foreseeable future, but how do you see beauty and self-care brands innovating to stay competitive? And then I'd love your thoughts on some specific brands beyond your, 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 you know, uh, your own brands um, uh, that come to mind that, that, are, that are innovating and, and in a way that's unique and, and is um, future forward thinking. Share some thoughts on that. Well, I think uh, I mentioned before Miriam Peloton, but I think you know, before coronavirus and before Black Lives Matter, the, the, I think the, the pressing concern for virtually everyone globally was the environment. And wellness and the environment completely overlap. They're interdependent because you can't truly be well on a sick planet. You know, we're, we're breathing its air, we're eating its food. And if the planet is sick, then we'll be sick. So wellness was taking a larger definition and sustainability or doing the right thing for the environment became a bigger thing. So I think that the innovations around that about how can we give back to nature? How can we make sure we embrace nature, not exploit nature, mm -hmm. uh, is really the key for all of us. And that's where we were going uh, in our path leading up to all this. Uh, and I think coming out of the pandemic, we really need to rethink how we're going to reacclimate uh, into society. I think what we've seen, I'm going to get a little bit philosophical for a second, and maybe not be answering your question directly, but I think there's a bigger thing I want to touch on is 
what we're seeing with these two things, with coronavirus and Black Lives Matter, really is like a toxicity of exploitation. We've exploited people, we've exploited the planet, and now we're seeing what, what, what's come from that. And when we come back and we reacclimate into this world, we need to really rethink about how do we come back in harmony with each other and in harmony with the environment and stop thinking of each as something to use to advance myself, but how can I live in harmony so we can all live a better life in a better world? And I think that every company needs to think about what they're doing from a social standpoint, what causes they're doing. Uh, they need to think about every single part of their projects, of their products rather, and where they go in the, you know, in, how does it affect the environment? Where's a product go at the end? You need to make sure that they're being accountable for it. And, um, and people need to think about when they go back in, do I really need to buy that stuff? Do I really need to travel there? And really think about the world they live in in a much different way and think about wellness as more of a global way of living than just, you know, me, me, me. And yeah. uh, I think that's the thing we have to look at. That's the big picture thing we have to look at going forward. Great perspective. Thanks, Mike. Yep. Yeah. Craig, any thoughts around that? You want to um, add? Let's see. I think that because you asked also about like, are there specific things or, or, or products and trends? And I, I think uh, Mike hammered on a lot of really important things. And sorry, I'm just looking there like just some people that are like walking around in my backyard. That I don't know who they are, but that's okay. They're, they're welcome. Um, <laughs> what I would say, we're a friendly bunch. What I would say is um, I'm certainly seeing, and, and this is about also, I think, a harmony, plant-based everything. I mean, it's happening everywhere. There's plant-based everything. And the thing is, back in the day, everything was natural. You didn't say, hey, want to come back to my natural house and have a you know, cup of tea? You literally, um, you went back to your log cabin. It was a natural, it was wood. It's what you had, right? Before that, you, you go back to your cave, right? It wasn't like, want to go back to my natural hole in the side of the mountain. It was like, that's what you had. Everything was natural. Everything started, I think, to become sort of unnatural, commercialized, industrialized, when it was about efficiency and it was going to be better living through chemistry. And we could create things that were, quote, unquote, artificial to speed up the supply chain, to get costs lowered, because it was hard to, like, grow stuff. Now we're using all this technology we have, or it feels like we are, to uncover all this magic from nature that's always been there in many cases. We just didn't have the tools to extract it. And we didn't have the wherewithal to extract it in a way that was affordable for a lot of people. So the fact that you could go, let's see, like I think um, a lot of people have issues with plant-based uh, meat products. I, I don't eat meat. But man, I got to tell you, the fact that Burger King has a, you know, a Whopper that is not a meat-based product, right? like the Impossible Whopper, that's incredible. Impossible, Beyond, there are a lot of plant-based uh, food companies now. And again, there are a lot of arguments about whether or not that's really healthy for you or not, or if it's filled with other things that might have other uh, potential health uh, you know, concerns to them over time. But the fact that so many things are moving to plant-based, and, and I know someone posted a, a question about plant-based material for packaging. And we're starting to see that finally get to a place where it could be, you know, it could be doable. I'm looking around my messy desk to see if I have what I do. Um, we have a sugar cane tube. I think we're the first to really commercialize this in, in oral care, but it's a sugar cane tube. This is a pretty cool one. It's got CBD in it. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful tube and we worked really hard on hand feel, on hand, like what does it feel like uh, when you're engaging with it? Cause I'm psychotic about haptic response. But the big thing was, because I started looking at this stuff about eight years ago and it just wasn't ready for prime time yet. It couldn't withstand the rigors of like, if I were shipping this product and we're going to sit in a, in a truck on its way to Arizona, good luck. It just wasn't ready. It couldn't handle that kind of heat. But now science technology has helped aid and abet and get the material science to a place where we can use this. And it's, it's amazing. Um, so it's, it's kind of like pre-cycling, you know, like can, can we use natural materials to go into things and then can those things be, you know, put back into the stream and, and, and we're getting there. So I think that is a big trend 
is mm -hmm. going the right way. And you're starting to see that. You're starting to see big soft drink companies say, you know what, we're going to move to this plant-based structure. Whether it's a paper bottle, announcements have been made about paper bottles coming out of uh, companies like Pepsi. Um, Coke has had the plant bottle, which is a PLA bottle for a long time. There's a lot of stuff going on. So I'm personally very excited to see science and technology focusing on using sustainable, meaning resources that are renewable so we can keep you know, creating things that we love. I think he stepped on the power cord again. Yeah, I think so. Well, I'm going to pick up where he left off. Um, and as he said, everything started with natural. Mm -hmm. And as Barney said, I saw your note, Barney, he said even snake oil was natural. Um, and then everything slowly became synthetic. And synthetics really were finding what the natural ingredients did and find a way to do it cheaper and more, maybe more reliably. But the perversity of it all is now you have truly natural brands who are trying to scream, we're really natural. We're really this. So maybe we need to think about the labeling process different. Let's start with natural as the core, as the default. Mm -hmm. If you have GMOs, you have to say on your packaging, has GMOs, uses growth hormones, tests on animals. Mm -hmm. I think rather than the brands who are doing the right things, that they have to call on their packaging to be heard, that should be the default, that should be the starting place. I think everyone else should have to say, we test on animals. And by the way, up until recently, if you were selling in China, you test on animals, right? We use GMOs, we use growth hormones, uh, we use parabens. They should have to list all the things that they use that aren't natural and that aren't sustainable. I think we should flip it the whole thing, it's not gonna happen. But that would be, I think, a nice thing. But that just shows you the perversity of where we've yeah. got in the world, where yeah. you know, guys who are trying to do the right things are trying to be heard through the morass of, you know, terms like clean beauty and all these other things. Right, right, right. Yeah, and it, you've, you don't realize the, the, what goes into the price of something, why, why it costs what it costs, um, and the full cost of something, as you're talking about, right? What is the full environmental cost? What is the broader cost of it to humanity? Um, yeah, there's definitely an importance there. To, and, and it's surprising we can't get people to see that more, but I think it's up to us as the activist consumers and having and done our work with Patagonia, we they are definitely an activist brand, and the, at at the center of them is that conflict between as consume as we are consumers, if we define ourselves as that and not as human beings that 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 are here to do other things other than consume. Um, you know, there's there's a there's an inherent conflict in that, right? The more you produce, the more you sell, the more you contribute. But if you can sell better, sell things that are better for us generally, and continue to advance that, right? Push that, um, there can be a lot more to be done for sure. Um, I'm looking around for Craig. And to... I love, yeah, I'm sorry. I love that you said that. I think whenever I hear someone use the word the consumers, if you treat people like consumers, you're not treating them like people. You're treating them like things are put on the earth just to eat things and buy things. And it just dishonors them. And I think that you know, we don't call them producers, yeah. Right. Yeah. Why, you know, why don't we call them? I, I, I love that. So I, I I'm sorry. I, I don't know what's up with my interwebs. I think because we have so many power outages here, it just I just got nuked. So I'm on my phone. I don't know if you guys can hear me. Okay. Um, okay. Good. And I don't know if you can see me, but that's okay. You're 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 lucky if you can't. But what I would say is, um, just because I just jumped in on on what I call the dreaded c word, I literally never ever ever use the word. I'm going to use it right now, uh, except in this context, do I use it? Consumer. I, I only use the word people and we're people. We happen to consume things, but the idea that, that companies act in this way where they treat people um, as quote unquote consumers or as a psychographic or a demographic, we're people. I also hate the, the, the term human resource. Like we're humans. I love that part, but we're not resources. Like we're, we're people. So um, I think it's, it's uh, we're seeing, we're seeing that words really do matter. They always have, but they seem to matter a lot more now because again, we've, we've gone through something and we're continuing to go through huge social changes. You know, we're talking about climate change. We're seeing, we're seeing uh, community climate change. We're seeing real societal 
change and the climate around how we treat people, that, that part of the climate. And it's fascinating. And as people that are stewards of brands, it's up to us because again, people, they, they write their narratives, like I said earlier, through their stuff. Like we as stewards of making better stuff need to really listen and uh, need to keep stepping up. So it's, uh, it's a really fascinating time. Yes, good that's great. A, um, an entrepreneur. It is. It is definitely a good time to be an entrepreneur. So for everyone, start something if you haven't already. And then also don't use the word consumer or at least question it when it comes <laughs> up as a word, right? Um, I think it's a, it's a great conversation to have inside of organizations. I've had it with people at General Mills and other organizations where they've tried to get rid of it. It's not an easy word to remove from your lexicon. I'll have you say, it's, it, it's amazing how many times it shows up. You're like, I just said it again. I can't believe they said consumer. I shouldn't say that. Can you imagine um, like you come but, home and you say, hey, mom, I want you to meet this consumer. I love, I'm in love with her. I mean, <laughs> you, can't, you can't put consumer yeah, in my, You can't, some, you can't my, uh, any word with consumer. It just doesn't work. Yeah, I love it. My other favorite word that I, I enjoy making fun of is uh, a disruptor or disruptive. And basically, no one's ever said to, to, to build on, on Mike's like, hey, this is the, the consumer that I love, uh, mom, uh, I want to marry her. Um, no one's ever said, hey, honey, next time you're at the, you know, next time you're shopping, can you pick me up some of that disruptive, hello, charcoal toothpaste? God, it was so disruptive. You know, they're such challengers, the way they really challenge my morning routine. Like no one ever does that. The <laughs> only people that ever call anybody uh, uh, disruptive are, are the people being disrupted, right? Like, no, no yeah. human ever calls that. Do they say, oh, hey, Mike, you know, hear me wrong. God, I love it. The way it like disruptively you know, <laughs> like, uh, changed my, my facial routine. My God, my skin has never looked more disruptive. <laughs> like, never. Like I had Crazy. your food product and it was so disruptive. I was in the bathroom all night. You know, it's <laughs> <funny. laughs> oh, we are going to go there. And oh, wait. boy. We need to go there. <laughs> you need to go there. I'm glad no one's mentioning exit strategy right now. Oh, so, oh your turn. Your turn. Oh, Sorry. no. It's right there. Okay, well, we I could have said liquidity to... events, but there you go. Okay. Oh, right, right. Hello, oh, toilet paper. Nice. That's our goodbye we, line. Yep. That's the right. yeah, Can yeah, I ask yeah. a granular question, an ingredient question? And this is for, this is the, the beauty geek or ingredient geek in me. You both have products with charcoal. Let's talk about for those that don't. I mean, the average consumer may not know the benefits of. So charcoal, and then let's talk about other ingredients that you're seeing, again, now showing up in this new form of, of beauty, wellness, self-care. Go, Mike, Craig, who wants to take that one? Mike, you go first, because I'm trying to see if I can sign back in, not on my phone. <laughs> well, there's, there's so many incredibly powerful natural ingredients that you sometimes have to question, why do you use synthetic stuff? You have something like charcoal, which is one of the most amazing purifying ingredients on the planet, whether they're man-made or synthetic. I mean, we use them in filters to filter water. Uh, they remove impurities on your face. They, they get rid of the toxins in your body. Uh, there, there's so many benefits to it. And, you know, it's, it's a great abrasive agent to make your, your teeth whiter. Um, it, it, and, it, and it's plentiful. And there's no harm to the planet in, in getting charcoal. And so why would you get, go with anything that's not natural? Mm -hmm. You know, we have a product coming out that uses prickly pear, which is a cactus flower. And that uses the succulent root and tissue system from a cactus. Nothing retains water better than a cactus. So why would I use any synthetic ingredient when I have cactus flower? You know, there's such amazing stuff on this planet that we can use in a friendly way that doesn't hurt the planet. Why would we put this synthetic crap on our bodies? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. more of that. Okay. You know, you have so, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Charcoal, again, amazing. Uh, we source ours from, you know, from bamboo because bamboo grows like the proverbial weed. So it's a really great sustainable uh, source of, of charcoal. Not all charcoal is created equal, but you know, we're very careful about where we get things um, and how we source them. Another ingredient that we're excited about, we're doing a lot with 
hemp seed oil and hemp and also CBD. That's certainly very trendy, but it's another, it's another great ingredient. Even, you know, hemp seed is not new and hemp seed, you know, we could have a whole conversation about CBD and THC and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, hemp, the hemp plant does, you know, it, it's got so many uses. And again, it grows literally and proverbially like, like a weed. It's, it's a relatively easy thing to grow. Uh, so in terms of renewability, it's right there. And it's a it's an amazing moisturizer. And and when it comes to oral care, uh, moisturizing your mouth, believe it or not, is nature's way of defending against all sorts of germs and bacteria. Like the, the production of saliva in your mouth is what helps wash away a lot of bacteria and germs. So if your mouth isn't moisturized, if it's not kept moist, if you don't have the regular flow of saliva you're supposed to, you're going to run into all sorts of other systemic issues. So these are very healthy ingredients. Um, they're, they're relatively easy to grow and they have real benefit for people. That's the whole point. It's not to be, oh, it's on trend. It's on trend because it's gonna do a lot of good for a lot of people. That's the best kind of trend. I think people use the word trend or trendy um, as a pejorative. And I think it's just the opposite. It's like, it, it, it's popular for a reason. It's not popular because it sucks. It's not interesting for people because it's bad. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's important to look at um, the actual benefits and real, real uh, utility behind some of these ingredients, not what just seems to be getting a lot of play on the worldwide interwebs. Like there's, and, and if it is getting a lot of play, there should be a reason why. So, yeah. uh, you know, ignore the hype part and look at the look at the factual bits. No, I love that. <clears throat> okay, so I want to I want to switch gears to talk about entrepreneurship a little bit, um, because you're both um, design driven entrepreneurs. Um, and that has become, um, it's getting more common. It's not common enough. Um, I think Craig and I uh, originally fell in love because of his entrepreneurship uh, and, and design background and connection to method and, and a variety of other design driven brands um, that we can all look up in your background if we need to find out how much you are into that. But I would love to just your perspective on entrepreneurs and um, and what inspiration you provide them to go out there and do something, to start something, to um, start a new business, to start a new brand, to launch something new. What advice do you give to people when they're sure. when um, heading down that really, road? That's a great question. Um, uh, wow. So I, I, I do love people. And if anyone, you know, uh, if we're not LinkedIn, please go on LinkedIn and link in with me. But, you know, I, I say on there, I love, I love people. I love, toothpaste, I love design, I love people, and I said people twice. People are amazing, and people have ideas, and I think the biggest thing is people get nervous, and they get scared that they can't make their idea a real thing, and I spend a lot of time with students. I'm an entrepreneur in residence at Babson, um, uh, mentoring at the Holt Prize, which is really an unbelievable organization. With, I, I work with students all over the place all the, all the time, really, and because it's so exciting to meet people that are unbridled and are willing to take chances. So what I tell a lot of entrepreneurs is um, you should have no fear of failure. You should have fear of not trying. So mm -hmm. it, it's, it's not about fear of missing out. It's, I call it font, fear of not trying. It's not, not FOMO, it's font. So, cause if you don't try, you've already failed. And most people are like, well, I don't know. I, I, I don't know how to do that. I'm like, you now have the interwebs. Like, I'm sorry, but I'm 54 and we did not have the interwebs when I was getting involved with a lot of these things that I got involved with. And you could find anybody. And they're like, well, I, I don't know how to talk to that person. I'm like, well, then, then you need to work on that. Like, you can reach anybody now. Anybody is findable or reachable. And what they don't have is a lot of time. So the thing I try to explain to people is just don't waste anybody's time. It's it literally, I mean, it's trite, you know, because it's true. That's why it's trite. No one has time to it. So I just try to encourage people, don't, don't fear failure, fear not trying. Go out there and meet as many people as you can and connect as many dots as you can. And be kind. I can't even tell you how many people ping and they just like want to see if you'll really pick up. And it's like, yeah, I pick up but, and I'm happy to talk to you. But like, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> and people are like, well, I don't know. I'm like, well, if you don't know and you called, that's, that's not so good. <laughs> so, um, don't waste anybody's time, do the work and don't be, don't be scared of failing, be scared of not giving it a go. And then you have to, I think, do your best to magnetize your, your idea 
so that the coolest, smartest, best people can come and do their coolest, smartest, best work. And you got to know when to, when to really let go um, and realize there are things you're not partic- probably very good at, but other people really are. And I try to encourage people to figure out what they love. Because if you love something, it's never going to feel like work for you. It's going to be you doing what you love. And because you love it, you're going to work so hard at it and it won't feel like work. You'll learn so much and you'll get so, so you know, into it and you'll get so good and you'll become so expert in your, in your area that you're going to rock because you're going to love it. It's like, so Mike and I were talking about guitars earlier and I always keep guitars by my desk, even though I was a, per- a percussionist because I'm a terrible guitarist. And, and every time I see it, it's a reminder for me of, of infinite possibility. Like I could learn the craziest chord structure. I could throw in a uh, mic. I can throw in like a diminished fifth somewhere. I could do some crazy thing. And, and it reminds me like that I suck. And then I think, and if I think I'm good, it's the ultimate reminder that like, there's so much more you can learn. And there are 12 notes in a musical scale, but like Mike and I could play the exact same scale and it would sound different. And that's what's so magical, right? We're all people, we're all wired the same way, right? We all eat and sleep and drink. We like to, you know, speak with other people, but we're all different. So we have to figure out how do we, how do we embrace those differences? And then how do we find the commonality and create things that people can fall in love with. That's our job. Whether that's a career, a place where they go and do their best work, or it's a product that they feel um, represents the values that are important to them. That's it. So love, 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 love. It's the heart of everything people love. And don't ever think you've, you've figured anything out. Because as soon as you think you figured it out, you're screwed. That's what I'd say. <laughs> Humility. I love that, Mike, specifically for you. So uh, this came about, this particular session came about because we were talking to somebody and, and we said, you know, we should probably be doing more in beauty. And um, and, so, and they said, well, who do you know in beauty? And I said, well, I, I met this guy, Mike, years and years ago. Um, and they And they said, Mike is like the big deal. I mean, if you want to do anything around beauty, knowing Mike, you're like, you're there already. And, I, and, and here's a situation where I didn't know how much, I mean, the true incredible value of Mike and his contribution to beauty and contribution to the world of sustainability and responsibility and a loud voice he has and how much reach he had. And it was amazing to me. I'm like, and then I asked him and he's like, yeah, I'm in right away. And then he and between he and Craig, they've out promoted this event more than any of our other past speakers have. They've got like, they've done the Ski Brothers and, the, and like, it's just amazing how much they've done. So incredibly generous, incredibly humble and kind, um, wonderful attributes of an entrepreneur. But what other advice do you give, Mike, to entrepreneurs, people that are looking to do this adventure? Well, I would, the first of all, that was really sweet. Thank you. And well, I, I echo a lot of what Craig said. You know, and just, you know, I also love people and man and woman and camera and TV in that order. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Wait, wait. Can you say it again? Can you remember uh, that? And say it one more people, time. People, man, woman, <laughs> camera, TV. Did I do right? <laughs> um, and I, 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 I completely agree with Craig. It's you. I, at a certain point in your life, you say, I, I, I want to do something that's truly me. And if you're going to make that decision, really make it truly you. It's true to your ethos. What do you stand for? How do you want to change the world? or change the industry? What's so important to you that it just, it, it speaks of you? Right, so follow your ethos. So for me, it was honoring women because I've seen the industry take advantage of women's insecurities for 30 years and try to exploit that. I don't like that. And for me, it was taking care of the environment. And for me to have like, like things that really do what they promise. I and mean, we parted right away with Women's March from, from day one, Global Citizen, NAACP, because that was important to me. So I tell people, follow, like, like Craig said, follow your heart. What's true to your ethos? But don't go chasing that dollar. If you chase a dollar, you're going to lose your soul. There's so many opportunities. Hey, COVID's happening. Make a hand sanitizer. Hey, you, like, no. Do what's right for your business. Do what's true to your soul, or you're going to lose your soul in the process. And I'd also say, for all the people... Like people like Craig and people like me were always there for you and we will always be there for you, but always use our time wisely because um, sometimes I, I, I had to stop seeing people a lot because I was spending 
half a day helping people on their businesses and I was losing track of my business. So just the only thing that in the world that's fine at the time. So just be, um, you know, uh, uh, sensitive of that. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, I didn't think I would, I would ever get to a point where I would say, um, no, I, 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 like you, Mike, I, I try to help any way I can because so many people have been so helpful to me. No. And I never forget that. I never will forget that. And some of those people, by the way, are on this call. So for those of you, and I think you know who you are, I thank you immensely because you had patience and support and you gave me your time. So thank you. So I try to give that back as well. And then yep. there's a Skype button on the Hello website and it's real and it comes to me and I get pinged all the time. I have it turned off now because we're, we're doing this. But it's, it's real and it's, it's a gift to be able to figure out what you love, like Mike was describing, and, and go for it. And, um, and I applaud anybody who gives it a try. And if I can be helpful, because again, it's the right thing to do. You know, I, I, I have two kids and I just keep telling them all the time, if you put positive out, positive comes back. If you put That's negative true. out, what do you think comes back? Mm -hmm. So it's like the easiest math ever. So I just just keep trying to put positive out, even in the midst of all this insanity that's going on. Just, just keep trying. And I'm with you, Mike. Like the other thing I hear a lot from entrepreneurs, they talk about their exit. And I'm like, don't talk about your exit. Talk about making something amazing that people can fall in love with. It's not about the exit. Like I know, oh, a rising sales curve, you know, is the most beautiful design ever. It's like, <laughs> no, the most beautiful thing ever is when you create something that people feel something magical about and the rest takes care of itself so when you focus on creating something beautiful special magical defined a lot of different ways it, that could be defined as more natural it could be defined as more sustainable it could be defined as more affordable right for me it was a big thing to try to make hello affordable for people because i'm like everyone deserves a, a, as natural product as, as ours is that goes in your mouth and goes in your body why should that be for the one percent Right. It should be for the hundred percent. So my happiest day was when we got to launch in places like Walmart and Dollar General, because you know what? Someone shopping there, all they want is to be able to get everything that their family needs and hopefully have like enough left over to buy a candy bar or a lollipop for their kid. And why should that person not have a natural product or a vegan cruelty-free product? Like that's for me, that was the thing for me. I wanted to make stuff for, for everybody. And, um, and I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm riffing, I'm sorry, I'm waxing poetic here or, or obnoxious, right. but um, <laughs> that's what it's about. It's like, you got to find your thing, just like Mike said, and you got to be true to it. And the rest takes care of itself. If you just focus on the money, you're going to be screwed. Yep. Just make sure you're oh, doing man. what feels right. And the money is, is out there. It's going to find you. Yeah. <clears throat> Great. Well, you know what we are, we're in trouble because we don't have enough time to really cover the Jenna Jameson guitar scene situation. Oh man. All right. So do I have to show it? Do I have to like, yeah, you definitely have to show it. This All is right, still with the, the tag on any, it. Still yeah. Cover, the, tag on it. There's cover the, tag. the children's eyes, cover the children's oh, eyes. Oh, it's the, Oh my goodness. There's the Jenna Jameson flying V in there all of go. its rock and roll glory. Cause the this flying is like, V is really, you know, it's important. So um, <laughs> there you go. Thank you for that. Yes, it still has the tags question. on it. Can I ask one last quick question? And I'd like to do this after every session, but specifically with Mike and Craig. Name a book or movie that you've read or seen recently that you would recommend to this audience today. Jojo Rabbit. Oh Jojo my Rabbit. God. It's so yeah. amazing you said that because every time I've managed to find five minutes to actually like break away and, and like sit in front of the TV and I click over, I see the same scene the first like five minutes and then I'm like, damn it. Or sorry, the, the, like five minutes in. And I, I'm like, I got to watch it from the beginning. So that's high on my list. And I, I, I'm, I'm dying to see that. Um, and then hold on, I'm going to show you if I can reach down here and not block my camera at the same time. The other, um, the book I, I leave by my desk all the time is, oh, the places oh, you'll go. Yeah. Um, oh. Yeah. Because you know what? It's got it all, man. It's got yeah, it everything. Does. Everything you need yeah. is right there. So I mean, Dr. Your... Seuss, really. I mean, Dr. Seuss. I mean, come on. Oh, yeah. Theodore Geisel got it right. So from, that's it. From a book standpoint, I think like my innovator book is The Fountainhead. 
It's just, it just speaks to me, but it's not a new book, obviously, but I've read that three times and it's it, just for an innovator. It just says there are no limits, you know, follow your passion all the way through. Um, and yeah, but Jojo Rabbit is a movie. I, I've never been in a movie where I laughed and cried that level, like that one. <laughs> That's why I couldn't, I couldn't start at five minutes in. I was like, I gotta see it. I watch all I have to go on demand. Right. I gotta watch the whole thing. Yeah. Fantastic. Right. That is great. That's great.